Okay, good evening everyone. My name is Dr. Nguko. I'm an orthopedic surgeon at uh, Machakos Orthopedic Clinic. It's interesting that you would think that uh, orthopedics, we have nothing to do with vaccines. And for that reason, because we've been having a lot of questions from our patients, uh, people come here, they are complaining of back pain, but then they ask me, Dr. have you had this vaccine done? Or have you had this one done? And, that, and we tell them, uh, yes, we have. And then many of the other questions that they ask, we are really unable to answer. So we've called in a specialist, uh, Dr. Umbeva Malande, and uh, Dr. Speck is going to be introducing him in a short while. So those who need to get ready with pens and papers, please do. Those who want to ask questions, please start posting them in the chat. And I will invite Dr. Speck in to introduce Dr. Umbeva and also tell us about the program for how we're going to go about our discussion today. Dr. Speck, please take over. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Ombeva Malande. Ombeva and I go a long way back, also with my husband, Levi Sunguku, we were in Makerere around the similar times. So he, he decided to do pediatrics and while well, I chose anesthesia. Yeah, but aside from that, he's also a lecturer in Makerere University and works as a director in the East African Center for Vaccines and Immunization. Um, it is my pleasure to have him join us, and he's the right person to be able to answer all your questions. So, Ombeva, uh, please go ahead and present. We can spend 30 minutes on the presentation, and then um, later on we can do the question and answers. Please write your questions in the chat as we go along so that we can have an opportunity to have all these questions answered at the end. Welcome, Ombeva. Thank you so much. Uh... I'm so honored and so glad to be able to participate and get involved in this conversation. This is one of the things I like to do a lot. Vaccines is my passion. And uh, this gives me a lot of pleasure to get this opportunity and this honor. Um, I'll be able to just briefly share my slides and then I uh, start off. Okay, very well. So that's uh, um, the topic that we are going to discuss today. I need to mention that as, as, a, as a Specky said, uh, I'm a primarily a pediatrician. So I'm a doctor who treats children and specifically children with infectious diseases. So that is my area of specialty and uh, vaccinology. So when I finished my pediatrics in Macquarie University when I was studying and I went to the University of Cape Town and studied uh, uh, vaccinology and pediatric infectious diseases. And so I teach at both uh, Makerere and Dijatun University, and I'm also a research associate with Sefago uh, Mahato uh, University in uh, Pretoria, South Africa, and also a director of the East Africa Center for Vaccines and Immunization. Uh, that is a center where we basically talk about vaccines, um, advise governments, support introduction of new vaccines, support um, addition of vaccines into immunization programs, make sure that countries have uh, adequate numbers of vaccines, uh, areas where there are new diseases emerging where vaccines could be introduced. So basically that's all we do uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in 11 countries. So those are the five East Africa countries and uh, the six Horn of Africa countries. Basically that's what I do uh, when I'm not uh, seeing children and when I'm not um, teaching uh, university students. So I'll uh, right away uh, state that uh, I do not have any um, conflict of interest to declare of any kind. I, I do this on behalf of uh, uh, the Machakos Orthopedic uh, Clinic you know, and for many other, I know there are very many people who will tune in who are not necessarily from uh, that particular cohort, but you know, you're all welcome. And that's purpose, you are the reason why we are having this conversation. Uh, I, I, I am a public servant, as I say, I work for the government. Um, so first I'll just reflect on the current uh, COVID situation in Kenya. What we know as that Thursday, so that's yesterday, um, Kenya yesterday recorded 1,091 new cases of, uh, of uh, COVID-19. And that was out of 5,900 uh, tests. The thing you keep hearing uh, people talking about called the positivity rate. It's uh, 
given by the number of tests that turn positive from the total number of tests done. So if you do two tests and one turns positive, then the positivity rate is 50%. So, because um, it's one over two. So when you get 1091 over 5,958 and then you multiply by 100, that is how you end up with an 18.3 positivity rate. And what does that mean? That means that that's quite a high number because the World Health Organization recommends that countries should try and put in measures to control COVID-19 that will keep the positivity rate to below 5%. So every country is usually targeting 5%. So 18.3 is quite a high percent, I should state. And uh, our total number of cases are 149,000. So we are just almost uh, reaching 150,000 total cases in Kenya. We've done over 1.5 million tests since when COVID uh, uh, testing started in the country uh, last year, March. Now, um, of these new cases and the current uh, patients who are sick, about 1,600 patients are admitted in different hospitals across the country, and uh, about six, close to 6,000, yes, 5,500 patients are on home-based care at different levels of recovery. And then in terms of ICU occupants at the moment in Kenya, we have around 261 patients in ICU. And uh, of those ones who are in ICU, you know, in an ICU uh, room, not all patients are on ventilators. So some are usually on ventilators, others usually are not. So uh, those ones who are receiving ventilator support are about um, 261 patients. Uh, oh no, those ones who are receiving ventilator support are 44 patients are on ventilator and 261 patients are in ICU. And then um, besides that, we have other patients who are on oxygen who are not um, on ventilators, but they're on oxygen. So these ones are usually like what, in what we call a high dependency unit, HDUs. And those patients who are in HDUs and high dependency unit, we have around 264 patients who are receiving oxygen. Um, and some of them can even receive oxygen in the general ward. So these ones get the oxygen either in just general wards or in HDUs, 14 in HDUs, 215 in the general wards receiving oxygen on support. I need to mention that about vaccines, we have had about six, over 600,000 people now vaccinated in Kenya. So that is around 616,000 uh, who have received this vaccine that is called the AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, of this, only about 130,000 are health workers, and about 92,000 are teachers, and about 345,000 are the general public. And when we talk about general public, we are talking about the elderly, we are talking about other people who are considered to be at risk groups that are eligible for, for vaccination. Now, when we look at the Kenya situation, um, overall, if you are to pick all the patients who we have had who have died, and those have been around 2,424 who had died by yesterday. And you compare with all the patients who have, we have had who have been confirmed as cases of COVID. The mortality rate, the number of people who die is given by those who have died over those who have had the disease. Our death rate uh, is around 1.6%. That figure is called the fatality rate. So you get the number of people who have died over the number of people total that we have had, and you multiply by 100. And uh, the other important figure to know is that 98% of our people in the country have been local transmission. What this means is this, that the spread of COVID within the country and the people who are getting the disease within the country, there are 98%. That actually means that the disease has become uh, our local disease because it is spreading within our communities. People are spreading it to their friends the family members, to the relatives. So it's largely now a Kenyan disease. As yet we know that in 2019, November, it started as a disease in China, but only 2% now of our cases are imported out of people who are coming into the country. If you looked at uh, our timeline, how has this disease behaved? If you look at these bars, you'll see that from this graph that I'm showing, that we had this rise in numbers around July last year, and then we also had another rise in numbers around November last year. And then we also had another rise in numbers now around March. 
So this graph literally peaks from March last year up to where we are today. So these periods when we have had sharp rises in numbers are called waves. So you can see we have that trap and then we have this cleft and then we have that trap and then we have this cleft and then we have that trap. So Kenya has had three waves so far and the current wave has been the most serious. You can see it peaked at 791 in a day. And, this, this in, and if you look at this weekly average, this week had 8,684 in March. That is the highest numbers that we ever received in a given week. So the, the wave that was there in November peaked at around 6,900. Uh, this one of this uh, current one has peaked at around 8,300. The one of July last year peaked at around 4,100. So that actually shows that this has been the most serious wave so far. And if you looked at our dates, you will see that the dates have pretty much seemed to coincide with the waves. As we have had a higher number of uh, uh, infections during the waves, we have also had deaths coinciding. Of course, like I mentioned, the overall average death rate is 1.6, the fatality rate, but you can see that the numbers have peaked as we when in fact, um, if you looked at uh, the number of cases among health workers, let me just see, I think the next slide here, you can see that even among our health workers, the cases have also coincided with the increases in the number of uh, COVID uh, presentations. Um, what do people mainly come with? So the people mainly come with cough and fever, and then a bit of difficulty in breathing and headache. And, uh, but only about eight to 10% of our cases have symptoms. Most of the others do not have any symptoms of not. Fever occurs in only about four out of 10 of our cases. Uh, I've always said that, so do we really need to have these thermogans that people have at gates of building? If we are only talking about only about 4% of cases uh, being febrile. And I think it is still important because if you pick these four, you can help them. You know, four out of 10, if you are dealing with 150,000, then those are around 15,000 people. You know, 15 times four, around 60,000. So that's a big number. If we come to looking at age distribution of the cases that we see, the males are around 61%, the females around 39%. That means out of every 10 cases of COVID in Kenya, six are likely to be men and five and four are likely to be women, a ratio of uh, three to two. If we look at the distribution via age, uh, you will see that, of course, we know that our youngest uh, ever case of COVID was a newborn and our oldest has been someone over 100 years of age, but you can clearly see that Majority of our cases, about 28% are in the age group of 30 to 39. So this is where we have had the most people affected. And this is serious because this is the productive age group. Actually, between 20 and 50 is where we are having the biggest burden of our diseases. In fact, this means that COVID affects the productivity of our society because most of the people in that productive age are the ones who are sick. And when you look at the children under 20 years of age, they are only about 20% of the total of the cases we have seen. So here you have four plus four is eight, and then five plus seven is 12. The total there is 20% of the total cases. Um, like I've already talked about this slide, but the point I want to make about health workers is that when it comes to looking at symptoms, 22% of our health workers present with symptoms. So national average of our patients with COVID, only eight to 10% have symptoms. But when it comes to here, then only 22% have symptoms. Meaning that health workers tend to present more with the symptoms than the general population. Maybe because they understand more the importance of reporting the symptoms that you see. The next part is I want to just mention about vaccines. Before I go to the misconceptions, so Kenya has adopted a first approach to COVID uh, vaccine rollout, where the plan was to first give it to health workers and then move on to individuals above 50 years of age and also individuals who have uh, prevailing conditions, what we call comorbidities. You are looking at anybody above 18 years who may either have diabetes, sickle cell disease, chronic lung, cardiovascular diseases, renal, which are kidney diseases, HIV, TB, obesity, and other conditions. And then after that, the third phase 
will involve people who live in congregate settings. So here we are talking about prisons, we are talking about detention centers, shelters, uh, refugees, and things like that. And then after that, we'll go into the general population. So that is pretty much how Kenya desires to approach vaccination against COVID. And so far, like it was mentioned, we have around 600 and uh, over 650,000 people who have re received the vaccine so far now. And um, of this, the men are around 56, women around 44 percent. So it's really almost a ratio of one to one of those who are receiving uh, the vaccines. And uh, these are targeted people above age of 58 and then healthcare workers also and teachers and security officers. In fact, if you looked at the number of people who have received vaccines now, the health workers comprise only 21% of those who have received. So uh, only around 136,000 health workers have gotten the vaccine, yet they're targeting 280,000. So we still have quite a bit of work to do to get all health workers vaccinated, maybe around 35% out there who still need to be looked into the vaccination status. And then if you looked at um, teachers, for example, only 365,000 have been vaccinated against a target of 2.5 million. So only 14%, that's doing fairly poorly. Yeah? So, and if you looked at, in fact, the total average, you'd see that the countries only managed to do 21% of our target of vaccinations, meaning that we are still very far. We've done 650 against a target of 3.1 million. The target of course is, Kenya receives its vaccines from COVAX, and COVAX is a, an initiative by the World Health Organization and the Gavi Alliance and CEPI. And what they do is that they are trying to provide vaccines to poor countries. About 92 countries, which are low income countries, some from Africa and some not from Africa, are being given this vaccine, at least to first ensure that they vaccinate around 20% of their population. So they initially receive this, and like I said, the healthcare workers, all the adults and those who have serious health conditions are the ones who are being targeted first in phase one. And then phase two, uh, the, the target is to move to countries that are high risk of impact, people who are having high disease levels, and then countries which have vulnerable health systems, where you may not have so many sick, but the health systems are hardly working. And then you are looking at countries with vulnerable populations, maybe more elderly, uh, more people in congregate settings, prisoners, refugees, and more. And then, uh, in addition to phase one and two, some doses of vaccine will be reserved for other vulnerable populations. And this may include, like I mentioned, refugees, asylum seekers, and workers who work in this sector, because they will also be at risk. Now, in terms of uh, these vaccines, you know, vaccines go through a process of manufacture. And this process uh, is what you call medical phases. So, there are two phases. First, these vaccines, before they are used, they are tested in animals. And then after animals, the vaccines are tested in humans. So you have to start with animals first, and then you progress on to humans. And uh, when you are doing your vaccine in animals, most of the time they use monkeys. They can use mice, rats, and things like those. And you get your particular molecule that you want to do your test on, the vaccine that you want to use. And once you get it, you go get your animals, your monkeys, or your rats, your mice, and inject them. After you inject them, you check and see, one, is it safe? Does it kill them? But two, okay, if you're happy that it's safe, the second question always is, does it stimulate the immune system to be able to produce the immune kind of reaction or response you want? If that happens, then you are quite happy. Then you go and seek approval again. You go to the National Science, technology and you tell them now I'm happy I've tested this in rats and it has shown this level of immunity you measure and you tell them I want to test it in humans. If you are given the permission then you go to what you call phase one and in phase one you get few people maybe 10 maybe 15 you give them you inject them with that particular drug and then you monitor them and check is it safe does it kill them and two does it stimulate the immune system if you are happy then you move on to the second phase. And the second phase, you now get a bit more people. You say, like you had, say we did it in 15, let's now do it in 100 or 200. You could even now divide them, say this number will be elderly, this number will be women, this number will be men, this number will be children. And then you give them. And then again, you check. And again, you are trying to find out, is it safe? And you're also trying to find out, does it stimulate the immune system? 
If you are happy with that big number, then you go to the third phase. And in the third phase is so important because here, then you have to have a few people who you will not give the vaccine. So you get about 10,000 or 20,000 people, you give them the vaccine. Get another 10,000, don't give them the vaccine. Give them something else. Maybe let's say water for injection, which doesn't uh, harm them, and you inject them with it. When you inject them with that particular one, and make sure that they do what? Make sure that they, they, they don't know. So the person who is getting the, the injection will not know whether they're getting the vaccine or not. And the people who are injecting also want to know. The doctors are not supposed to know. So you blind the doctor, you blind the patient. Once you do that, you must get your result and then you compare. If you see that the people who did not get the vaccine are getting the disease more and the ones who got the vaccine are not getting, then you are happy. You know that, wow, our vaccine is working. And then once you do that, and you have proved that it works, then you go and seek for authorization. So they give you some immediate, uh, initial authorization, and then finally, when they are happy with it and they've monitored it, they give you complete approval. But along this process, you can find that it is not working, so it, the study can be abandoned. So, so far, in terms of phase one, when the, where, where, uh, the phase where they're in animals, about 89 vaccines are currently being tested. And then around 23 have reached the final stages of the, the work. Uh, in phase three, around 23. Now, there are about 52, which are already in phase one, testing in few people like 15, 10, then there are about 37 vaccines which are now being tested in more people, maybe let's say about 200, 300 people. Um, those are the phases. Every vaccine goes through that. Even the, all the COVID vaccines have gone through all these phases. And they will work differently. Some can work as the RNA vaccines that we are talking about now, where the RNA is just a message. It sends a message to the body and tells it to make him immunity against COVID. So it's not like it changes anybody's DNA or anything, but it just sends a message to the body and tells it makes this kind of protection, this kind of uh, uh, policemen, antibodies to protect the body. And uh, an example of those mRNA vaccines are uh, the vaccine made by a company from US called Pfizer and another company from US called Moderna. Those were the very first ones to make their vaccines. And their vaccines are quite effective, about 95%. And then there are others which uh, are a wild adenovirus. So the viruses, these ones come from monkeys. And this type of viruses called adenoviruses are removed and they are uh, grown in the lab and then they are weakened or killed. But on them, you carry a message. And that message that they carry goes to the body and it tells the body, make this vaccine. So adenoviruses engineered to express the part of the coronavirus that stimulates the immune system, the so-called the spike protein, um, is put on this and then that's just injected. So the adenovirus is almost like a transporter or like a carrier. It just gives this one a leaf, the messages to the body. Vaccines that have been made using this technology are like the one we use in Kenya now, the AstraZeneca vaccine. Even the Johnson and Johnson vaccine and uh, another one by another company called CanSino, they are all adenovirus vaccines. They also, you could also get a vaccine called uh, use of an inactivated pathogen. Activated virus stimulates the immune system to produce antibodies using killed or weakened viruses. And an example of that is Sinovac, where you get the, uh, a virus and you completely inactivate it. So you completely kill it and then just inject it in the body. When the body will see it, it will stimulate the immune system. You could also decide to use the DNA of the virus itself, inject it into a person and produce the, the kind of antibodies that the body wants. Or you could break the virus into small pieces called protein. And then those particular molecules and the genes of the viruses are also injected into the person and they produce immune system. And an example of that vaccine is called Novavax. So there are so many types of ways in which uh, these vaccines can be made. But at the moment, like I said, the one we use in Kenya is AstraZeneca, the one that uses the adenovirus. And you can see those vaccines are shown here in this slide, uh, AstraZeneca, Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson. And uh, the thing I wanted to show here are the side effects. So across board, the side effects are pretty much similar. You'll get a bit of pain, a bit of swelling, a bit of redness in the area of the injection. And then you may get a bit of headache, tiredness, muscle ache. And you can see AstraZeneca has quite an, and, and many people who have gotten this vaccine in Kenya will tell you they got a bit of a headache 
headache seems to be the common sign we are seeing people having and tiredness, a headache and tiredness and muscle ache, they are quite common. One, a few may get a bit of chills, joint pain. But pain, of course, at the injection site, almost everybody feels it. Because pain is, I mean, injection entering the body will cause pain. Um, the cheapest of these vaccines you can see is uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine that we use in Kenya. Can, other, other companies like um, uh, Bio, uh, uh, bio, uh, 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 Bharat, Bharat Biotech of India has also now formed their own vaccine, and then Sputnik of, uh, of Russia also has. All those companies have vaccines that need two doses. It's only Johnson and Johnson that requires one dose, but all the others require two doses, and you can see there. So it's important. And the other thing I want to mention. So when does protection start? Because this question people have been asking me. AstraZeneca vaccine, 15 days after the shot, or 22 days after the first shot. Here the first shot, after about three weeks, it begins to demonstrate the, the protection. And then uh, the Pfizer vaccine is seven days after the second shot or 12 days after the first. The Moderna vaccine, it's 14 days after the second shot and 14 days after the first. Uh, Johnson and Johnson. So it's the AstraZeneca one, the one we are receiving in Kenya. Three weeks from that shot. That's why you've seen some people getting COVID even after getting the vaccine, like happened to one of the governors in Kenya. It's because within the first 21 days after the vaccine, you can get the infection. Now, to what's the end of this talk? I just want to talk about a few of the myths and a bit of the misconceptions. There are people who've said that these COVID-19 vaccines were made so fast in a way that was hurried and uh, uh, people could have skipped stages of vaccine manufacture and so it's not safe. That is not true. Because I have just taken you through the whole stage of manufacture of the vaccine. And this, this research for the RNA was going on for almost 24 years, two decades before this process. And these vaccines have been found to be very safe, 95% effective. So they are not, there's no way that anybody skipped any stage. In fact, before these vaccines were licensed, the FDA gave very strict guidelines and told people, okay, fine, you want to make us the vaccine, you must satisfy three conditions. One, you must prove that your vaccine is at least 50% effective of all the people who get it, at least 50%, these vaccines have shown 95% for Pfizer, 94.5% for Moderna. You know, so the percentages are way higher than what they were requested. And then they were told, you must make sure that when you give people the second dose, follow them up for two months, follow them up for two months so that we see, does anybody get hurt? Does anybody get harmed? And then, the people who did not receive the vaccine, they must show that they, this will, because remember I told you, at the third stage of the study, you must show that some people did not receive the, the, the people who received the placebo, those are the ones who did not receive the vaccine, they received the placebo. They are supposed to have at least five of them showing that they got the disease. And not only did they get the disease, they got severe disease. The disease they get must be severe. Why is that important? That is important because you don't come and tell people our vaccine works. But how can your vaccine work unless we are sure that there is a disease in that community? So there must be some people who get the disease, those ones who don't get the vaccine. Now, all these six vaccines which are now licensed have satisfied those conditions. Another condition that was given is that you have to show that the vaccine has been safe in that 60 days period you put on the mask. And that was done for all the vaccines. So we don't need to be worried. Now there's another myth people have been saying that the vaccines cause infertility. This is not true. And this comes from the older talk of where people used to say, oh, uh, tetanus vaccine can harm you, can make women miscarry, can make them infertile, can make them not conceive. 
I've even heard people talk about cervical cancer vaccine like that. That cervical cancer vaccine will make people miscarry, will make people not. No, that doesn't happen. The vaccines are safe and they do not cause anybody to become infertile. You've also had people say that it will change people's DNA. It is being used to introduce 5G technology. It is going to change our makeup as people. The vaccine doesn't do that because none of these vaccines changes your DNA. The RNA vaccines that we know about, the, the Moderna and, and Pfizer, the RNA doesn't enter into DNA to change it. They just give a message to the body to produce. You know, the antibodies, antibodies are almost like the army or the policemen who protect the body. So that is not true. It doesn't alter the DNA. I've also heard people say that COVID vaccine has chemicals in it and that uh, it can harm anybody who can get, a, can get a, the vaccine. And I think those chemicals, there are some vaccines and always all vaccines can have something in them. You know, something like, uh, something like uh, uh, a metal, like, uh, like uh, uh, there are vaccines traditionally which have had some mercury in them, but it is very, very small and its purpose, those ingredients, even some sugar is put in some vaccine, the ingredient is to keep the vaccine stable so that the vaccine doesn't get destroyed. So that it can stay up to the period where they've told you is its period before it expires. All of those things are included in that, in that vaccine. And so you are not supposed to worry about them. The vaccine has been tested and they're okay. They are not, they're not going to harm you. Now, there are people who've said that I already have COVID, I don't need the vaccine. No, that is not true. I already had COVID, not I have, I already had. If you had COVID before, you need to get the vaccine because of two reasons. One, the vaccines that we have now, they do not necessarily protect you against another infection. What they do is this. They make sure if you ever get an infection, you will not get admitted and two, you will not die. They are 100% protective against people who get it, against severe disease. What about uh, uh, infections? That means somebody can get infected, especially with a different variant, but the outcomes are better. Now, if I already suffered COVID, I can get the vaccine and research has now very, very recently shown that people who suffered COVID and got just one dose, just one of the vaccine, developed protection that was seven times stronger than someone who never suffered COVID and got two. So it's such a big benefit getting the vaccine, even if you got COVID. Now, there are other people who say that uh, getting the COVID-19 vaccine means that I can stop wearing my mask no use. That doesn't mean so. It does not mean so. Because one, you need to continue to protect yourself and two, you need to protect others. Because we have not yet attained adequate immunity in the whole community. So we still need to continue wearing our mask. And because there is always the risk that you can get reinfection, especially if you get a variant that you never suffered from. It can give you reinfection and maybe it may be more severe. So the guidelines are such that let's continue wearing the mask until when we have a critical number of people who have been vaccinated, and then we'll be able to do away with the masks. The vaccine cannot give you COVID because this has been another myth that getting the COVID-19 vaccine can give you COVID. That's not true. It can't. Why? Because none of these vaccines are live vaccines. So live vaccines are aware the virus or the bacteria that causes the disease is weakened, but injected with people to stimulate uh, immunity. And some of these weakened viruses, whatever, like it happens in polio vaccine, can go back to the body and begin to regrow and digest and adapt and cause disease. The COVID-19 vaccine cannot because it is not a weakened virus. It is a dead or sometimes just components. Like you see the mRNA, it's just a message that you send. Um, COVID-19 vaccine side effects are dangerous. Okay, they are there. People, I showed you there, people get headache, they get body aches, they get fever, they get uh, uh, tiredness, they get malaise, they can. But the point is that these side effects are not so bad as to cause death. The only cases where you can have 
a very severe worrying side effect is somebody who has serious allergies, and so it causes something medically called an anaphylaxis. But usually the doctors are able to deal with it. So everywhere you go for vaccination, they give you a number and tell you you can call us if you feel this and that and the other. Now, uh, somebody's, uh, another myth has been people usually say that now that we have a vaccine for COVID, we can make vaccines for common cold, HIV and other diseases. That is not quite true exactly, but it is the hope. We actually hope that we should be able now to make other vaccines using these technologies that have been used to make uh, the COVID uh, vaccine, only that it takes time, it takes time. So it's, it doesn't just mean that now that we have this, we can have that, no. These viruses are different. You know how the HIV virus is different, height, height, height of it. So it will not just be that like one plus one is two. No. Now, another myth has been that people with underlying conditions should not get the vaccine. And I get this question a lot. Um, I'm elderly, I'm over 60, I have blood pressure. Should I get the vaccine? I have had previous treatment for clothes when I was pregnant, should I get the vaccine? I've had, so all sorts of people with all sorts of conditions, we are seeking that should we get the vaccine? So the people who have underlying conditions, they can safely get this vaccine and actually should, because they're the people with the vaccine actually is targeting. They are high risk, so they're encouraged to get the vaccine. Now, I've also had people talk about those with suppressed immunity. They also fall in this category, those with HIV and whatever. But and the biggest worry for suppressed immunity is that it's usually because people say that when the immunity is very weak and you get this vaccine, it can cause the disease. But that happens more in vaccines that are live. The COVID-19 vaccine is not a live vaccine. So it wouldn't uh, uh, harm your body so much. Uh, others have talked about pregnancy, even breastfeeding, that I shouldn't get vaccinated if I'm pregnant, even breastfeeding. Now, this is not true. Pregnant mothers can breastfeed. Even breast, pregnant mothers and breastfeeding mothers can be able to uh, get the vaccine. And remember one thing, that they need the protection. This vaccine doesn't come out through breast milk. So the mother will make antibodies, and these antibodies can come out of the breast milk and protect the baby. But the, the vaccine itself does not. And in any case, um, the dangers of COVID on a pregnant mother, the disease itself are way more than any dangers you would worry about the vaccine. Now, recently, we have heard about clots and people saying that COVID vaccines are now causing to clot, they're dangerous, they are not safe, they lead to clotting. And uh, I want you to just know that while it's, the risk is there, it is so small. It is 0.00004%. Four people out of every 10,000 people can get clots with COVID vaccine. But what about the pill, this birth pill that we give to our pregnant mothers? While four out of 10,000 will get a clot because of COVID vaccine, about five to 10 women who get the COVID vaccine five to 10 out of, 12 out of 100, who get the, the birth pill, the birth control pill, can get the clothes. What about smokers? It's even more, 18 in every 100. What about if you have COVID infection? The percent is even higher, 16.5%. You see how high it is? So COVID as a disease puts you at a bigger risk of clothes than the vaccine. So you're actually better off embracing the vaccine. Other myths that people have said is vaccines can cause autism. This is not, this, this thing was, uh, was uh, uh, started by fears that were generated in 1997 by a study that was published by a doctor who was called Andrew Wakefield. And uh, this, this doctor was a surgeon in Britain. And so he went and published his article in one of the biggest journals called The Lancet, and uh, said that people who get the mumps, the measles, and the rubella vaccine uh, are at a high risk of getting autism. And autism is that disease where children get uh, problems with the language, and even besides that, they get problems with social interaction, they become very hostile and rough to other kids, and then they become very stereotyped uh, and rigid. 
uh, but this paper has eventually dis discredited all that this doctor uh, uh, um, surgeon published. They found that his study did not meet any uh, uh, required uh, ev evidence levels showing that he did the research actually and he did find that you know, it was just a, a lot of lies. And things. But even then, observation studies have been done with mums and rubella vaccine and has found that the vaccine does not cause autism. So I'll, I'll ask to stop there and then we can uh, have the questions and, uh, and have the discussion. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Mbeva. That was really enlightening. In fact, you know, the Bible says that my people perish because of not, lack of knowledge. And this one is, uh, I would say, very literal, that people would perish because of lack of knowledge. We make assumptions about things that uh, we think are going to harm us, and maybe they are not going to harm us. It, it, it's really very enlightening. Thank you. And so if you'll allow me, I will go through the chat. So anyone who has not posted questions in the chat, post them in there. Um, so at least we can start going through them. So I will just start all the way from the top, read them out, and then give you an opportunity to answer them. Um, so starting with uh, doc somebody here called Stevens. Stevens has asked, South Africa phase two of the vaccination targets people over 60. In your area, and that is Kenya, we are targeting people who are over 50. How do we explain the difference in the age and what are the WHO guidelines? And then I'll just, let me just read two to just answer every two and then we keep moving. Uh, he also comments that he did not see any comment about the Sputnik and the Chinese vaccines. How do Africans perceive these vaccines? Maybe answer those first two questions. Yeah, so the first question is that uh, the issue about uh, South Africa, the, you need to remember that South Africa is not using the same vaccine as the other African countries because of the South African variant of the, the, the coronavirus that they have, um, which is not well responsive to the AstraZeneca vaccine. So South Africa has been using Johnson and Johnson vaccine, which was found to be uh, better protective for the South African variant, which is, which is more lethal and more uh, destructive. So now, South Africa is the only country which has set its own targets there. Even these other countries have looked at their own circumstances and the numbers of disease. Remember the numbers of people with the disease in South Africa are very many compared to the rest of Africa. I think even if you combine the rest of Africa, it may actually just be, you combine all the rest and then you put South Africa aside and you see there at par. So the population of numbers above 60 are very many in South Africa compared to the numbers that you'd find in Kenya and the other countries. So the other countries can even lower it up to 40 and still not be anywhere near half of the number of people who are eligible in South Africa. That's one of the things. So it is, it is a, a country uh, decision. That said, WHO uh, and, and COVAX, which gives the vaccines to these other countries, had put that age at around, initially they had put it at 70, then they lowered it a bit. Kenya puts it at 58. Uh, Uganda puts it at 70. So a country looks at its own uh, challenges, looks at the number of vaccines they have available, and then they set the rules. And I want to say this uh, tank in tech. You see, like Kenya, for example, we were able to introduce the vaccine to the elderly and teachers quickly before even we finished the healthcare workers. The reason was because looking at in-country circumstances, there was the third wave which was so dangerous and it was killing so many people. And so a decision was made that we cannot stay for over a month in the country with a vaccine while we are putting substantial numbers of populations at risk. Why don't we just bring all of them on board and try and go through this as fast as we can so that we protect as many people as possible. In terms of the question on uh, Sputnik and China vaccines, um, in terms of Africa, majority of Africans now are using the uh, AstraZeneca vaccine because remember this vaccine, these countries are not buying it. They are getting it for free under the COVAX facility, which I said is uh, brought together by the WHO and uh, Gavi Alliance and, and, and CEPI, Center for Epidemiology CEPI. Now, this vaccine is made in India. 
by the Serum Institute of India. Through permission from AstraZeneca, remember AstraZeneca is a German company working together with a British company, Oxford University, and they made this vaccine. But they've given their formula to the Serum Institute of India to produce the vaccine on large scale for Africa. So this is a negotiated deal and countries therefore are getting that and they are not allowed to sell it. Now in Kenya recently, a few people imported this Chinese, uh, Russian vaccine, Sputnik, which is not included in the COVAX facility. But when they brought it in and they wanted to sell it, the government had to stop them. Because the commitment at the moment is that we do not sell COVID vaccines. People should be able to get them for free. Thank you. Um, this question was from me. How do we compare the effectiveness of the COVID vaccines, just generally all of them, to other vaccines, for example, influenza, hepatitis, and the like? So that when we say that a vaccine is 60% effective, is that a good figure or is that a bad figure? Thank you so much for that question. Now, the flu vaccine, let's just pick the flu vaccine. The flu vaccine is 40 to 60% effective. So when you say that the flu vaccine is 40 to 60% effective, and then you are looking at uh, Pfizer vaccine, which is 95% effective, and the Moderna is 94.5. That is very high. The effective rate is, I mean, this, this, these uh, COVID vaccines have posted figures that nobody imagine. In fact, I think when the FDA was putting the, the figure at 50, they hoped that they actually even reach the 50. There were fears that people may not attain that kind of effective measure. So they picked like an average of 40 to 64 because flu and COVID, they all affect the same part of the body system. But the vaccine surprised us because of the technology. The mRNA technology really enables uh, possibilities for very high effective rates. So COVID vaccines have posted the highest effective rates ever seen. Now, you, you look at protection of severe disease and, uh, and death, and these vaccines put it at 100%. 100% is so high. We've not had that with the previous vaccines. Only yellow fever vaccine had approached 100%. Protection for people who get the disease dying. So this is, this is unprecedented. The COVID vaccines are having very high, very high rates. And then the, the other question that I've seen there. Yes, actually, I'll just let you continue. My, my connection is unstable, and so I lost yeah, the yeah. question. So just read yeah, through so and I can, go I ahead. Can just, yeah, I can go through the question because I can see them here on chat. Yeah. There's another question. Is that one of those who are reported to cause clots? I did show the, the picture in my slide share where, where a presentation where I said that you're actually more likely to get more clots with the... Um, COVID itself as a disease or with uh, smoking, then you are likely to get close to the vaccine. But because the vaccine is a new thing, remember, there is a continuous monitoring of these vaccines once they are licensed. It is actually called phase four. It's called post-licensure uh, monitoring, where the vaccine has been licensed, but it continues to be monitored to see if it can be able to uh, uh, cause any harm. So, they will continue to be monitored. And as soon as they see any issues, the vaccine will do what? They will be able to relook the vaccine again and say, let's relook at it. Let's relook at it. Yesterday, no, two days ago, uh, America stopped the giving of Johnson & Johnson because they want to relook at their data again and see. There were about, I think, uh, a few women who had reported clothes. So they do, they always do that. They always stop, relook at it again, and then come up again and check. So something like that. Uh, uh, and, and someone has even asked there, it's quite concerning uh, when these reports of DVT and thrombosis keep coming up. Yes, that can, but these people could be having COVID. So before we say that the vaccine caused clots, test them for COVID. I've just said today that the AstraZeneca vaccine after the first dose requires 22 days before the effectiveness peaks in the blood. Between the day you got the vaccine and those 22 days, you can contract COVID. And if you do, the COVID is more likely to give you clots than the vaccine. So that is why we say, check the person, check if they have COVID, check if they are smokers, because those are things that can make them have clots more than even the COVID itself. Um, somebody has asked, how does vaccination protect one against emerging variants? 
So this is a question that is not fully answered yet at the moment, because RNA viruses are notorious for mutating. That is something they're very notorious for. They mutate a lot, a lot, a lot. You've seen that with, with, the, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the NHS. And so what happens is that every time they will keep studying. In fact, yesterday, Pfizer said that they are studying all the emerging variants and seeing how they can improve their vaccine. So people who had already gotten their two vi uh, injections may eventually 12 years down the road require another booster just to cover for any variants that will have emerged. And this we do a lot with the flu vaccine. You know, every year we produce a, a new flu vaccine type because during the year we do surveillance. We collect all the information on circulating variants and then the vaccine that comes up is different. We do not yet know whether that will be the case for the COVID vaccine, but it, it may well be the case. So the, there is continuous uh, monitoring of that, of the variants. That's why South Africa said, no, we won't take AstraZeneca. We'll take Johnson & Johnson because it seems to have a better barrier for our variants. In Kenya and Uganda, we haven't had significant problems with that. Kenya had two cases of the South African serotype among two South Africans who traveled from South Africa to Mombasa in December, but they were contained and they recovered. So the goal is to, every time you do a COVID test, you send a sample for a COVID test, you want to travel or something like that. Part of that sample is sent for genotyping so that we can be able to check and see are you having a, a variant or not. Of course, we have the South African variant, we have the UK variant, we have the Brazilian variant. Those are the most notorious ones. There's a question here saying the challenge of using viral vectors to make vaccines is that some people may already have immunity to the adenovirus, and this may risk them getting a less effective response. That is true, but only to the if you are doing a vaccine against adenovirus. But because the vaccine in question is uh, COVID, then it doesn't matter what the adenovirus does, because we are not interested in adenovirus. It is just being used as a carrier. It's like a transporter. It's like the way the, the, my pen here carries the ink carrier inside it. So you have the pen, but inside it, I have my ink carrier. So the pen is just a transporter. The ink carrier inside here, which carries the ink inside the pen, I mean, I could use another thing. I could get something else and drop the pen. So that is the point. Uh, and, and, and that's why it doesn't really matter much. Um, the other question is there that some questions that people have asked. If I had my first dose of COVID-19 vaccine, then I get a COVID test positive before my next dose. Should they go ahead and take the next dose of the vaccine? So first of all, they first need to treat the COVID. When the COVID is done, they should get the next dose. I just said today, Pfizer did a study that in Israel that showed that people who got COVID and then got the vaccine developed immunity that was seven times stronger than those who never got COVID but got two doses of the vaccine. So it appears that previous COVID disease enables you to get an even stronger response, even just at one shot of the vaccine. So this particular case, after they are done with their treatment, they can be able to get their, their vaccine. Because remember, we have said there's a lag period of between two and three weeks, even up to four, to be able to develop uh, sufficient immunity after you've gotten the vaccine. Now, someone has said other countries are stopping the use of AstraZeneca or Johnson & Johnson because of concerns of clots. Um, uh, other let me just read the question again, that uh, other countries are stopping the use of AstraZeneca and Johnson or Johnson and Johnson because of concerns of clots. What options do they have? What should Kenya do? There are talks about heparin induced thrombocytopenia being the cause of the clots reported in the media. Yeah, that is quite true. Um, these countries are exercising abundance of caution. They're exercising abundance of caution. We now clearly know that your risk of clot is even higher through smoking, through use of contraceptives than it is through the vaccine. But because of abundance of caution, they want to investigate. And one of the questions they are trying to answer is this. This person who is getting a clot, is it because of the vaccine 
or is it because he has contracted COVID? Because remember, COVID can give you worse clot than, than the vaccine. And the problem has been rushing to put these patients on heparin or on flexane. So we are saying, no, don't rush because heparin may actually worsen the, the situation. But those are the questions that are being checked now. Um, Chiles is a COVID-19 surge despite vaccination success. ICU units are overwhelmed. Could it be that they delayed in rolling out the rest of the country? I mean, that could be it, but delaying and rolling out the other parts of the country does not necessarily uh, increase ICU admissions. Increasing ICU admissions just means that their vaccination program is not as successful as we think. Because all of these vaccines, they give you almost 100% protection against severe disease. So ideally, if you got the vaccine, you shouldn't end up in the ICU. Those who are ending up in ICU must be those who have not yet been vaccinated, the vaccine naive patients. How safe is the vaccine for infants? There was one who received the jab and got serious side effects to an extent of being admitted. That was very dangerous. Why would anybody give a vaccine to an infant? Infants are children under 12 years of age, 12 months of age, I mean 12 months. Vaccines are not supposed to be given to any child under 18 years of age. Pfizer's vaccine is the only one that can be given to under 18 but above 16 because they tested from 16 to above. Pfizer has just completed a study now in children and the vaccines are showing safe but it hasn't been licensed. So we are not vaccinating children anywhere. Even if they have comorbidities, even if the child is a secular, even if the child has diabetes, even if the child has that disease, they are not supposed to be vaccinated until when we get the authority. So that was very wrong. And how long should I wait to be vaccinated after I got COVID? It's now five weeks since I left hospital. So that's a good question. If you got COVID, you should get your vaccine as soon as you test negative PCR or 21 days. If you don't get your PCR, then 21 days from the time you tested positive for COVID, you get your vaccine. Why? Because uh, some guidelines and most guidelines around do not require that people should do uh, uh, a PCR. They just say once you are okay, you have no more symptoms, you can go to work. But in the event that you didn't do the PCR, then 21 days after, you should be able to do your vaccine. So median time from the studies of patients we have received locally, most of them turn negative PCR by 14 days. And those who don't, at least by 21 days, they should have done either PCR or are no longer symptomatic. So that's why we are saying at 21 days. Um, somebody has said here that, uh, uh, thank you Dr. Mbeva for the presentation. How soon is it till we achieve herd immunity in Kenya against COVID? Israel says they have achieved herd immunity. Is that possible so soon? Uh, no, because, um, of two reasons. One, the fact that we are very far away from hitting our vaccination target. Even just a small number of 3 million people that we are targeting, the highly specific people, healthcare workers, teachers, security guards, we've only done 600,000. So we are so far away in even meeting target in that small number, let alone community protection, where we have to vaccinate about 75 to 80% of all people in Kenya before we reach that, that, uh, that, that particular immunity. And the other question someone said, is the vaccine safe for lactating and pregnant mothers? Yes, I've said it is safe for lactating mothers and pregnant mothers because the vaccine does not cross the placenta and it does not cross into breast milk. Only the antibodies do. So that's why. But if you ask for infants, no, because you are injecting the vaccine into an infant. That is different from a, an, a mother getting it and then passing an antibody to an infant. Those two are different things. And there's a question there. Uh, are the Sputnik and Chinese vaccines of similar type make up as AstraZeneca? There is a Chinese vaccine which is similar to AstraZeneca in make uh, because it is all adenovirus, even Sputnik. So they are, they are, they are similar. They are similar, yes. Um, the problem we had with the Chinese is that even the Russians who make Sputnik, they do not want to release all the information 
for scrutiny and auditing at, at, the, at the WHO. We do know that Sputnik is 92% effective according to data of the studies done in Russia. So again, countries face that challenge. But if you need someone to get a vaccine, then uh, my advice to you is that the best vaccine out of all these vaccines, the best vaccine that you can go for is the one you get to first. That's your best vaccine. If it is Sputnik, get it. If it is uh, AstraZeneca, get it. The one that you land on first is the vaccine that you should take. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that is very educative. That is very informative. I really have nothing else to add. Dr. Specky, do you have anything else to add before we close? Yes, so, sorry, I think the network had a problem, but just wanted to say thank you, Ombeva. And to everyone, this recording will be available on, on the, our Facebook page in case you one of you might want to read through it. And Ombeva, we want to thank you very much. And maybe you can just give us your patch in short and then close. So thank you so much. Um, I need to say that I'm so grateful at uh, two things. One, the opportunity to be able to have this conversation, but two, for um, the interest, the level of questions that people have asked has been amazing, very good questions and um, that are very informative, you know, and, and the questions that we are having people asking in the society. So I just want to say that um, you can listen to the recording and when they make it available, you can share even the Facebook link so that people get to get this information. We need the information to go out to as many people as possible so that all of us can be able to get the vaccine. And the other thing I want to say is that let's continue to observe the, the containment measures. Because remember this South African variant and the UK variant that are in Kenya. You've seen in Kenya, the UK variant has caused a lot of uh, death. So it's not easy, it's tough. Let's all continue to follow the recommended uh, containment measures, let's sanitize. Let's uh, uh, wash our hands, let's keep distance and wear our masks because we don't want to die of COVID. Surely, we are all we have. So let's just take care of each other, you know. These are hard times. One day, one day, a day will come when we'll go back to our normal lives. But while we wait for that day, let's all continue to be um, vigilant and take care of one another. Lastly, I want to say, there are those friends of yours, relatives, brothers, sisters, you know, check on them, send a message, call them. You don't just have to call someone when you are telling them, please call me or send me some MPS or a police or what. No, I mean, let's call people, check on them. You can never know how people are doing. Check on people, you know, people are getting mental illness, people are getting depressed because of COVID. Let's be there for one another. Check on guys, call them, find out how they are. Just that, you know, yeah. Otherwise, thank you so much, and I wish you a nice evening. Okay, thank you, and I think we can now end the, the presentation. Have a nice day. Thank you, sir.